Congratulations. I am delighted to, to wish the participants and aspirants of FinnoPitch all the very best in some really important work that you're doing to drive financial services innovation to improve the products and services for the customer. And that's something that's always been a passion for me. So I'm delighted to see the work that you're doing and I wish you all the very best with your efforts. Fundamentally, things have changed dramatically with the pandemic and we've been forced into that change. But then there are some uh, financial services companies that have been way better prepared for that change because they had already started down a journey of transformation to become more agile and flexible uh, so that they could serve the customer in multiple ways. And I think those companies that had already started and were well down that path have largely done very well through, uh, the, the changes because one, they've been able to adapt and serve their customers remote because they've created that channel capability uh, and uh, omni-channel capability over a large number of uh, uh, years in advance. Uh, I think there are examples where banks that were on the cloud and had a more agile capability were able to respond to government stimulus programs for SMEs, et cetera, much, much faster than perhaps their more established players. So I think this has brought about uh, a huge opportunity for startups who are focused on the right things from a customer opportunity perspective, uh, especially with SMEs around the world, and have built the digital and transformation capabilities uh, to be able to access those opportunities that have perhaps not been fulfilled by the larger incumbent uh, players for many years. And I think there's a lot more government support. Again, it varies by market for startups and encouraging these kinds of new FinTech initiatives to drive either financial inclusion or SME inclusion and more services uh, and more effective services. So I think it's been a, a, a really important point in time that will accelerate uh, digital transformation, but also uh, better financial inclusion, better access uh, for SMEs. And that is essentially critical to the economy. So I think these are great things that have happened despite really difficult circumstances. Companies are accelerating their efforts. Certainly, if, if I look at incumbent banks and financial services companies, they are accelerating the efforts in transformation and digital transformation so that the customer can do everything by themselves and it doesn't have to be face-to-face -face or in a branch location. And I think that's certainly one trend as far as the incumbents are concerned uh, uh, and, and that's accelerated even faster. Uh, in many ways, that is exactly the philosophy that we used to build our entire strategy at Shinsei Bank in 2005, which was that the customer must have the complete choice of how they want to interact with the bank, that is choice of channel. And then they can choose depending on the business model and the profitability as to which options you want to give them. Uh, so I think that has certainly accelerated quite significantly as I've seen in various innovation award submissions uh, uh, globally that I'm part of. The second part is the startups uh, scene and uh, the, the challenges, if you will. And these are all kinds of, uh, from AI solution providers to uh, data analytics, uh, to challenger banks and digital banks. And as we're seeing, particularly in Asia Pacific, uh, including the Philippines where I'm currently based, there has been a lot of activity in the last one year in terms of applications for new digital bank licenses across many of the Southeast Asian markets, as well as in places like Hong Kong, et cetera, uh, and of course in Japan. Uh, we're seeing that globally as well. And uh, I have great interest in researching uh, these. So if you, if you see what happened last year with uh, the new bank IPO in Brazil, uh, they are one of the most profitable and highly valued of these challenger banks 
Why? Because they created a really powerful credit card customer proposition in Brazil, which was significantly better than the more established banks. And they were able to grow rapidly through that. So the common theme across the challengers is that they have picked an area that the incumbents have underserved, where they've seen an opportunity because these are high margin businesses. They have gone in with an attractive proposition that gives the client better value and yet makes them enough money in terms of product margins and, and return on investment. And that seems to be the winning formula for many of the digital banks who have then grown and added new products and services like savings, uh, wealth management, etc. cetera. Uh, so those definitely are two key trends for incumbents versus challengers. The third I would add is that in many countries, the pace of, and this is more policymakers and regulators, are now actively encouraging uh, in developing markets a lot more efforts to drive financial inclusion, digital ID, because that's the backbone or enabler for that, as well as in places like India, initiatives like creating a common standard and uh, digital payment interface like UPI that has seen phenomenal growth uh, in, on the back of uh, uh, mobile payments and financial inclusion, as well as SME lending. And the final point there is, I think the growth of e-commerce, we've seen a huge explosion in the BNPL, buy now, pay later uh, propositions. And again, they are very different because uh, typically in the past, credit cards, et cetera, were limited to credit card users, whereas now with BNPL, anyone uh, can participate in that with a mobile uh, money account or a wallet or uh, through their bank accounts even, and they can even participate through a debit card. So it's really seen uh, new business models that we didn't see five years ago. And the pandemic has really accelerated that pace of change, both for the, for the incumbents, for the new players, as well as policymakers and government. Thank you. Um, I think there's a few factors, and, and I, the, the way I like to look at it, uh, I was very fortunate to live in uh, Africa in, uh, in 2010 when mobile money was taking off. It started in 2007 in Kenya. And um, uh, I think the, the, I've firsthand seen the growth of uh, mobile money and how it grew from. Um, you know, a small um, initiative um, in, in some of those markets into something that is such an integral part of the economy and even bigger than uh, uh, certainly any of the banking players now in, in places like Kenya. Uh, but then let's use a few examples and particularly emerging market examples because I see a common thread. Uh, and the common thread is this, that where the innovations like M-Pesa or Alipay or WeChat or Paytm and UPI and mobile uh, money growth in India as, as three examples, all of them are based on someone creating an innovation for a huge need that was unmet by the traditional banking sector. So for instance, Africa has the lowest uh, uh, banking penetration rates, sub-Saharan Africa. And as you mentioned, the mobile phone is something that almost everyone has. And today, almost half the world has a smartphone. So in 2010, by just texting money, if you could safely move money from someone working in Nairobi to their parents back in the villages or their family back in the villages, that met a huge need because there was no other way to do it or no reliable way to do it. If you look at the growth of uh, and financial uh, and group now or Alipay, it started with the need uh, for uh, how to move money safely between buyer and seller. But then I think it really took off when they started lending to SMEs, micro SMEs, household businesses, etc., that had no formal access to the, the formal banking system to grow their business. So if you wanted to start up a business sitting at home, uh, no bank would give you a loan. But once you were on the platform, 
with the e-commerce platform and they knew that you were selling and they could see that data and, and, and your payment information, that created enough history to be able to uh, start getting a micro loan and, and then increasing that as your business grows over time. Um, whether it's Paytm, which I feel recently in India, their uh, growth in the merchant business has been way faster than anyone else. And on the back of those million odd merchants that they've signed up in the last 12 months, uh, they're lending to many of those because they see the payment cash flows, etc. So these are things that the traditional banking system could never have addressed because uh, traditional bankers never did that kind of business or had access to that kind of data. Uh, and then the final point I think is, uh, is a really important one is that uh, in various countries, the regulators have been actively supporting and promoting that, both with regulation, with funding, and a whole bunch of initiatives uh, to, to drive that growth. So I think you're right. The way innovation is happening is different in many markets. The common themes I see is that the most successful innovations start with a real need. There is a real need for the consumer, the economy, and it's sizable. And these innovators have been very quick, clever, and focused on responding to that need and creating suitable propositions that have been delivered with technology through a phone and by using the cloud as a backend analytics and all of that capability to be able to do it. And where regulators have been supportive, they have played the role as a catalyst to further drive it. And, and then if you look at the challenger banks, again, varies by each market, but most of the successful profitable challenger banks have taken an established product category, be it credit cards, be it personal lending, have offered a much better proposition to clients because they use technology and they don't have the legacy to make it simpler, faster, more efficient, and more customer friendly. And they have built very successful businesses. So whether you look at new bank, whether you look at Tinkoff in Russia, whether you look at uh, uh, banks like um, um, the Starling Bank, which has adapted really quickly during this period, uh, I, I could go on. There are many other examples, including as we talked about Sony Bank and what they're doing in, in Japan. So all of these have a common pattern that they really focused on the customer need, created something really attractive for clients, and use technology to deliver it far more efficiently than anyone else. Thank you.